point, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Jeff Cole is the Director, Digital Future at USC Annenberg. He has been at the forefront of media and communications technology issues both in the United States and internationally for the last 25 years. He's an expert in the field of technology and emerging media, and he serves as an advisor to governments and leading companies around the world. Dr. Cole is director and CEO of the Center for Digital Future at the USC Annenberg School, as well as founder and organizer of the World Internet Project. So please welcome to the stage, Jeff Cole. Thank you. Am I? Yeah, I am on. It is an honor to be here, actually to be back. I think I did this three or four years ago. I don't know if anyone remembers. I do. Incidentally, if you're not aware of this hotel, this is the hotel the OJ jury was sequestered in. So I don't know if that makes it spooky or ominous or exciting. Uh, anyway, let's get started. I have promised to wrap this up no later than a quarter to one, so let's, let's not waste any time. I want to look at what I consider to be transformation at the speed of light. Over the last two years, Rupert Murdoch, the most powerful man in the media and entertainment business, looked around and all of a sudden realized he had become a small player. And Rupert didn't get small. Everyone around him got big. All of a sudden, the studios, which in the 60s and 70s used to be exclusively in the television and film business, with the exception of Disney, which also had theme parks, the studios in the 70s, 80s became parts of larger conglomerates of golf and western, and uh, Time Warner and all of those other entities, basically 100 to 200 billion dollar companies. Now they found themselves competing with trillion dollar companies. The scale had changed. Rupert couldn't compete. We estimate that next year there will be about 24 billion dollars spent on original programming for OTT. Netflix at the 10 to 11 billion dollar figure, Amazon at 5 to 6, HBO, which is still cable and over the top, but moving more to over the top, at about 2.5 billion. But AT&T, who ought to leave HBO alone, I even wrote a column called Leave HBO Alone, is going to go from about 2.5 billion, if John Stanky has his way, up to 4 or 5 billion. Hulu at around the billion dollar figure. And if you want a sense of how the scale has changed, just look at Apple. Apple's looking around, seeing what's going on, and says, maybe we ought to be in this business. Let's take a look. They hire Jack and Zamy, Jack and uh, Zach and Jamie, sorry, from Sony, two of the best television executives in town, bring them to Apple and say, we're not sure if we want to be in this business. We're sort of dabbling, but let's experiment. See what you can do. Oh, and by the way, here's $2 billion. And that's how the scale has changed. All of a sudden, Oprah and Reese Witherspoon and God knows what else is part of Apple. So the whole scale has changed. Amazon, which is owned by the richest man in the world, even after he may have to split his fortune, will still be one of the two or three richest men in the world, and I think will be number one again in a couple of years. Amazon, the minute Amazon says, we're tired of this Netflix getting in our way, could increase their spend from five or six billion dollars to 10 or 15 or 20 billion dollars if they really wanted to. All of a sudden, a little Australian newspaper tycoon couldn't compete anymore and decided to sell most of his television and film assets to Disney. When I talked three years ago, I went through the six studios and I had said my thoughts then were three of them, after an acquisition, would be ready to compete for the future. The ones that were ready to compete were Disney, even without Fox, more so now with Fox. NBC, Universal, Comcast, those three words say it all, uh, and AT&T, Time Warner, which we weren't sure was going to happen, but did. 
So those three were, looking at the other three, it's clear that Sony and Paramount are not able to compete and they're going to have to make some action. Clearly, Sherry Redstone is going to recombine Viacom and CBS, but I, even those two combined are not big enough. There's talk they may make a play for Sony. Even with Sony, they're not big enough, but something has to happen. And then three years ago, when it came to Rupert, I said he wasn't big enough. That part was right. But I thought he would acquire rather than be acquired. But he made the decision he couldn't, and now there are five studios, and it's part of Fox. The future is going to be very different. I believe it's obvious, not everyone agrees with me, I think it's obvious that Bob Iger, who has agreed to stay at Disney for the next three years, will assimilate Fox into Disney. He's already essentially cut and pasted Fox's television division into Disney. We have yet to see what he's going to do with Fox's film division, but he'll assimilate Disney into Fox. He'll get his Disney Plus channel under Kevin Mayer up and running. And then I think as he heads into retirement, the entire company becomes part of Apple. I have absolutely no doubt that Disney and Apple will be the same company within three to four years. So the scale is changing. Incidentally, Apple can buy Disney in cash. Apple can buy Disney or Netflix or whatever it wants without even a bulge as it's being digested. Think about AT&T, a $200 billion company, bought Time Warner for $85 billion three years after buying DirecTV for $50 billion. And a company, Apple's now under a trillion at the moment, but a trillion dollar company can acquire a $200 billion company, as I said, without even a bulge. So this consolidation change is completely moving at a speed unlike anything we've ever seen. And that doesn't even look at the role that Tencent, Baidu, and Alibaba may have in this space. Looking beyond, going back, one other thing I mentioned three years ago, but it's completely changed. One of the best parts of my job is that if something interests me, I can go in and study it, talk to the smartest people in the world who will give me input and advice. So three years ago, I wanted to know how much money does the average American household spend per month on communication services that didn't exist a generation or two ago? So we're not talking about landline phones, which our parents and grandparents had. We're talking about mobile phones, broadband, television, satellite and cable, now we're talking about Spotify or music services, satellite radio, DVR charges, and very soon, and I'll come to this in a minute, I think we're going to talk about movie theater subscriptions as well. In the US, I'll update the number from three years ago. The average household, not individual, household, spends about $294 a month on all of these services. Incidentally, if you, and some people spend much, much more than that, depending on how many movie channels, sports packages, or other things they have. But what's really compelling is that if you look at or below the poverty level in America, that 294 only drops to 206. The poorest people in America to them, mobile phones are not a luxury, they're a necessity. You will see penetration at the poorest levels as high as at the highest levels. Uh, broadband, in January of 2009, at the height of the recession, we saw about two million American households give up broadband to save 20, 30, 40 dollars a month and to revert back to dial up. Within a matter of weeks, they were back on broadband because the internet they had grown used to, 
with what would be Netflix and YouTube and video isn't possible in a dial-up world. The point being that broadband has moved from a luxury to a necessity. And television, while not literally a necessity, and 80% of us still can put an antenna on our roof and get free signals, but more and more the channels we want don't come from those free signals. So television has become a necessity for most of us, which is why at our high point, cable and satellite were 91.5% of American households. Uh, we see of that $294 a month, about 90 to 95 is spent on television. That means cord cutters are freeing up 90 to 95 dollars a month. Cord shavers are freeing up 50 to 60 dollars a month, and cord cutters are freeing. Excuse me. And then the ones who stay with cable, cable remainers, are freeing up nothing, but still may spend a little more money. We think Netflix has a semi-permanent lock on $10 of that $90, even for the people who don't cut the cable. The choice to go with Netflix is almost not even debatable. Incidentally, I don't know if anyone from Netflix is here, if you talk to Reed Hastings, the fact that Netflix costs $10 to $12 a month drives him crazy. And he's absolutely right. A little bit of history, which most of you know, how many of you were red envelope subscribers to Netflix? And if you remember, it seems like a hundred years ago, you spent 16 to 18 dollars a month to be able to have five DVDs mailed to you at the same time. At their peak, Netflix was the second biggest customer of the US Postal Service can never figure out who was the first. Uh, maybe Publishers Clearinghouse, I don't Anyway, and people loved Netflix because it wasn't so much that they didn't have to go to Blockbuster, because most of us had a Blockbuster pretty close, but it was there were no late fees. So we could have five DVDs, as you know and remember, you could keep them for months. You couldn't get new ones until you returned the old ones. And then Reed really fell in love with the concept of streaming, offered streaming as part of that red envelope package at $16 to $18 a month, and then became convinced that streaming, not the US Postal Service, was the future. Cut the company in half, this was 2011, called the old red envelope business, a name that only lived for about two months, except in the case books at the Harvard Business School, called it Quickster, and the other side remains Netflix, which was the streaming. And since those customers were paying 16 to $18 a month, he let those subscribers be members of both companies for $8 each. So they didn't lose a thing. But people were confused. They didn't know what this Quickster was. They didn't like it. They lost a million subscribers within three months. Their stock value went down 90%. It looked like one of the most colossal blunders since New Coke. But they clawed their way back, got into original programming, and Reed's argument today is that what's now $10, soon to go to 11 what you got for 16 to 18 was five DVDs of theatrical films that had been in the theater recently. What you get today for 10 is not five DVD, not five theatrical films, but dozens of theatrical films, which you can watch all at one time and you don't have to mail and get back. Interestingly, an area Netflix pioneered that Showtime and HBO never did, they put on massive amounts of, a of old television shows, and our work shows after the originals, that's the second most popular content, where you can go back and watch ER, 
or as I did a few months ago, 62 episodes of Breaking Bad in two weeks. You can do that, and then so you have all the theatricals you could want, all the old television you can want. Everybody knows they just paid $100 million to get friends for another year. And then $11 billion of original programming that's on constantly getting past the dilemma HBO had. Back around the turn of the century, HBO had one of the biggest hits in television, The Sopranos. And by the time The Sopranos became really popular, HBO found that in the second and third season, when everybody knew what it was, when The Sopranos premiered, as many as two million people added an HBO subscription, and about 80% of them gave it up when the season ended. That's the nightmare HBO faces with Game of Thrones now. Netflix, trying to get past that with their $11 billion, is creating so much programming that it doesn't come with any dry spill. So Reed's argument is if 16 got you five DVDs of theatrical, and now you're getting all the theatrical, all the television, and all the originals, that's worth $40 to $50 a month. And he's right. But he started, place, started pricing Netflix at eight, and the only thing he can do now is raise it a dollar or two every year, which he's just done, and it won't get to where it's a reasonable price for him for another 25 years. And that's just the limitation. But also, something's going to change. For that 10 to $12 a month, you got Disney films, Fox films, Universal, Warner, Paramount. You got also all of those studios making some of the originals. And Disney, as everyone knows, looked around. Actually, all of the studios looked around and said, we've created our biggest competition by taking money in the short run by selling all of our content to Netflix and Amazon and Hulu a little bit but Hulu owned by the three of the major studios until now, now being controlled by Disney, they realized they had really created their competition. So Disney decides to pull all their content, and we all knew that would be followed by an announcement that they were gonna start their own streaming service, which most of us informally referred to as Mouse Flicks until they decided to name it and they decided to name it with the incredibly imaginative name <laughs> Disney Plus, but the name doesn't matter so much. Warner has now decided, as part of Warner, HBO, and Turner, to create its own service. Universal, we'll come back to that in a moment, because that's a little different, creating their own service. It's not unlikely that Viacom and Sony will do something together or separate. The problem is the consumer, who has really been the winner the last couple of years, is about to get screwed. Because what the consumer was getting for $10 a month, they may have to pay $40 a month to get in three years. So it's clear the consumer is going to lose, and it's also not clear that the studios will win. How many of these services will we buy? Will we buy three or four of them? Will more of us cut the cord? And my guess is we're not going to see more than two or three of these. I think uh, what Universal's done, a little different, decided that they can't make the consumer pay more, so it's going to be an ad-supported over-the-top service. That part I think they deserve kudos for because I think ad supported is the future. But sadly, they're sticking to the conservative base. I can't imagine why NBC Universal feels so beholden to a cable company. Uh, but they've decided to go the old route by you have to authenticate that you're a cable subscriber to get the universal over-the-top service for free. I think CBS, with CBS All Access, has a really interesting model. 
because to look at the networks for a moment, I've worked with all four networks. I grew up with network television. I love network television. I have watched since I was a teenager people talk about the death of networks and that they are going to disappear and that there wasn't even room for three networks, they used to say in the 80s, let alone four networks when Rupert and Barry Diller started the Fox network. I've seen all the early prognostication of the death of the networks, but I really sadly, genuinely believe we now can see the end of the four broadcast networks. And this is how I think it happens. Just as Jeff Bezos got interested in entertainment and decided to build a studio rather than buy one and has created a very significant studio that wins Emmys and Oscars and could be the dominant force in entertainment as soon as he ups the ante and goes from five billion to 10 or 12, just as he got interested in entertainment, he is now interested in sports. And Amazon and Facebook and YouTube, Google, are starting to buy small sports rights. They're dabbling. But I think in the next cycle, if I'm wrong, the cycle after that, at the latest, Amazon and Facebook, if it survives, and Google, are going to start bidding on the NFL, the NBA, the NHL, Major League Baseball, and I do a lot of work in Australia, there, footy, the AFL, and rugby. And as I've said to the broadcast networks in America about NFL rights, when those rights come up, if Amazon bids, who's going to outbid the richest man in the world? Not you. Uh, already, sports is a loss leader for the broadcast networks. They rarely make money, occasionally they do, but they do it because they know what our work shows. Our work shows that for people under the age of 30, only 20% of their television is live. The other 80% is recorded or streamed. Of the 20% that's live, it's almost all sports. If you look at the top 10 rated shows on broadcast television last year, eight of them are sports, seven of them are NFL, which is why they have to buy sports even if they lose money. And if they lose sports, and I say this with no glee, the broadcast networks collapse. That doesn't mean they go bankrupt and go home, they have to go to OTT. And actually, there are great advantages. People seek out content. They follow content. I've been arguing for years that I grew up in Hollywood with the mantra, content is king. Pardon the incorrect grammar. Content is kinger than it has ever been. I learned this in the 80s when I was writing a book. And I used to write from midnight to 4 a.m. And at 4 a.m., my brain couldn't work anymore. I was completely frazzled, but I was so wired that I couldn't go to sleep. So I would watch television from 4 to 5 a.m. And in the 80s, the only television you could watch was crap. And while I don't, answer, I don't ever try to be viral, if you try to be viral, it becomes totally inauthentic. I just say what I think and then get puzzled at what becomes viral. But one of the things I said that becomes viral that sort of saddens me because it use a, uses a word my mother taught me never to use. And that was, nobody watches crap anymore. Now, what's actually, that's not literally true. What's literally true is nobody watches what is crap to them anymore. Because for me, the good stuff may be Masterpiece Theater. For you, the good stuff may be Honey Boo Boo. It doesn't matter. But we only watch the stuff we want to watch. We only watch it when we want to watch it. 
NBC figured this out a couple of years ago. NBC had a problem on their hand with Jimmy Fallon and The Tonight Show. And I don't mean the problem of the ratings. This was when Fallon was number one. Now, if you look at any of the talk shows, Colbert, Kimmel, go back to Carson, Graham Norton in the UK, any of those, they are all our shows. And if you take out the commercials, there are about 42 minutes of original content. And this is not a critical comment. On any given night, they produce about six minutes of really great content. And the problem for NBC and Fallon was the audience they, care, they cared about, the 18 to 34, were watching those six minutes on YouTube or Facebook where they weren't getting advertising. And they met and had to decide, what do we do about this? Do we sue them the way Viacom did a few years before over Jon Stewart and YouTube? Do we sue them? And very much to NBC's credit, they realized they were never going to get 18 to 34-year-olds to watch at 11.30 at night. They weren't even going to get them to watch the whole show. Isn't it better to build brand awareness and buzz by letting it be on Facebook and YouTube? That gives them some incremental improvement in the ratings. They can't monetize. And look now, having agreed to that, look at Alec Baldwin playing Donald Trump. The ratings of Saturday Night Live, since he started doing that, are up about 20%. They get the advertising benefits of that 20%. But the best evidence is that every time, Donald, every time Baldwin plays Donald Trump, it's seen by about a billion and a half people around the world on YouTube. I do a lot of work in Australia. When I get up on Sunday morning, first item in the news is two minutes from Saturday Night Live. Possibly an even better example is James Corden and The Late Late Show. The ratings for Corden are higher than they've been but you can never get a massive audience at 12.30 at night. But the ratings for carpool karaoke, the, uh, probably the best carpool karaoke with Paul McCartney, that's an opinion. I don't know how you could disagree. The over 2 billion people. So we seek out content. I grew up in Los Angeles working in the, in the entertainment business. I learned, not at the foot of, but I learned about programming from Fred Silverman and Brandon Tartikoff. And they could have taught a PhD seminar on television programming. All of that wonderful old stuff about you put a popular show at 8 o'clock, another one at 9 o'clock, and a new show at 8.30, and through hammocking, people watch it all. And the channel you put on at 8, you keep on at 11 to watch the news and the late night show. And Paul Klein at NBC, who used to say, audiences don't seek out the programming they want to watch. They seek out the least objectionable programming. All of that amazing stuff out the window doesn't even compute anymore. If I want to feel like a dinosaur, and it's easy to do, and incidentally, to Generation Z, you can be, sound like a dinosaur when you're 25, when you talk even about having used dial-up. But if I want to sound like a real dinosaur, I can tell a millennial or a Gen Z about when I grew up, I used to say to my friends, we can go out on Friday night, but we have to be home in time to watch this or we can't go out on Saturday until at that time, I think it was Mary Tyler Moore and Bob Newhart are over. That doesn't even make sense. The whole notion of television scheduling is gone. The most successful magazine in the history of magazines was TV Guide. And I, when I used to be a professor, I used to talk about, wasn't it ironic that publishing's greatest success came from a magazine that listed what was on television? TV Guide, Long Gone, Electric Program Guides, 
not gone, but pretty irrelevant. Almost all the buzz in television comes from social media. So scheduling completely changed, turned upside down, and everything about television is changing. The other thing, one of the, one of the I try to be as forward thinking in these things as I can. For, keep in mind that over the next five years, the automobile is about to become the second most important media environment in our lives. I really believe that driverless cars are going to be the most important societal change over the next 20 years. They are coming in the next five years. And we are going to consume more media and entertainment in the car than anywhere else in our lives except the home. One last thing, and then let's open it up to questions. If you go back to that $294 a month we spend, and we have added a couple of things to that over the years. I mentioned Spotify or music subscription services. I've been absolutely fascinated, as a couple of my friends in the audience know, about MoviePass. And I've written extensively about MoviePass. I bought a movie pass partially to see if it worked, partially because I wanted to see a lot of movies. I was fascinated that in December of 2017, I could pay $9.95 a month and in New York see 10 movies at $16.13 a movie, or I could see $163 worth of movies for less than $10. And that's because I went 10 times. I could have gone 30 times, but I have a life. Uh, and it was clear that MoviePass was unsustainable. They argued from the beginning they were a data company, and they were going to make all their money from data. For some of the articles I wrote, I called a re couple research companies, and I, including Lieberman, and I said, this is who I am. This is where I live. This is how many movies I go to. What's that data on me worth? The estimates ran from about three to about seven dollars. So it was clear MoviePass was never going to be sustainable. Their curse was it was such a good bargain. Their subscribers increased from half a million to three million within four months. And it turned out what they wanted were people who weren't going to use it very much. The people who bought it were movie lovers who went even more. What they really were after were becoming such a vital force to have so much leverage with the theater owners that they could command a portion of box office and concessions. And they might have gotten there, but they needed to get up to 10, 12 million and they couldn't handle the cash burn to get to that point, the cash flow. And they just, they're still around, they're trying to come back, but they've pretty much gone belly up in any meaningful way. But what that showed, what was really, is it, it awakened this incredible love of motion pictures. People going to the theater. And very wisely, AMC in particular, but a couple of the other chains and some outside forces have created competing services. AMC's was very reasonable at $20 a month that lets you see three movies, including 3D or IMAX, which MoviePass didn't let you see. They then found they, that itself was not sustainable in New York, LA, Chicago, raised it to 24, but my point of all this is I think the pass is going to be the most important development in theatrical movies over the next couple of years. Because Netflix was a bigger threat, I think, to motion pictures than to television. Netflix <coughs> or dinner in a movie had become Netflix and Uber Eats. And now, uh, Movies had become so expensive, $16 in New York, $14 in Los Angeles, that people were only really willing 
to go for something they knew they were going to like. Smaller films were really disadvantaged. Under Movie Pass, we had three documentaries last year that were pretty much blockbusters, not in documentary terms, but in film terms, whether it was the Mr. Rogers documentary, the Ruth Bader Ginsburg, or the Three Identical Strangers, I think the movie pass, not under the brand name, but the movie pass is here to stay. And sometimes a company shows the demand, opens the door, and then in itself disappears, and not related to this conference, but our work strongly suggests one of those companies is Uber. Uber, who has become a verb, we now talk about Ubering home the way we talk about Googling a name. Our work shows Uber subsidizes 60% of every ride. We think your great-grandchildren will talk about Ubering, but we're not sure Uber is going to be around to celebrate at the party. So that's a little bit of my view, not facts, my view, hopefully grounded in facts, as to the kind of transformation we see. I've said a lot of provocative things, including that Disney's going to end up at Apple, uh, which I think Bob would probably, well, he'd have to say with no, no way. Uh, but delighted, and to, we have about seven, eight minutes to take a couple of questions. I assume there are microphones, correct? Um, oh, soliciting questions okay. via slido.com. If All you right. want to go there on your phone, you can submit a question in writing. You want to say something offensive and you don't want me to see who you are. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's exactly right. for blunt, rude questions. And uh, we do have a question here at the, at the mic. I've said there's a bright light, so I can't. So where is our question? Oh, yeah, I do. Yes. I, I don't have a rude or blunt question, but I have, uh, I'd love to hear you talk about this. Um, having seen Ready Player One and read the book, how does virtual reality and gaming fit into the future in the next five to 10 years? I am incredibly bullish on virtual reality, but not so much in entertainment. I think virtual reality is gonna transform travel. Before you go on a vacation, you're gonna walk through the streets of Venice, you're gonna go into your hotel, look at the rooms. Even if you never get to Venice, it will be much better than a video. I think in educational training and a hundred other areas, I think VR is transformational. And entertainment, I think augmented reality is actually more interested in virtual. There will be some really interesting VR. And of course, we leave much of that stuff to James Cameron when he comes out with Avatar 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7 sometime in the next hundred years. Uh, but I, I just don't see it as transformational to entertainment. Can I ask a corollary question? Sure. For parents of Gen Z in the room, our young people find gaming to be, I'll say, better than the traditional entertainment. So how does that fit in? Uh, gaming has changed so much. Most of us know gaming when it was Teenage boys frittering away their time, serial killers in training, and gaming, first of all, there are as many girl gamers as boy gamers. Gaming has become probably the most addictive in all the good and bad senses of the word, form of media, and I find eSports to be staggeringly interesting. Now, I'm an old guy, and I don't, Old in this sense is over 30. And when I first saw eSports, people, Amazon spending a billion dollars to buy Twitch, a channel where you watch people play video games, I said, that's not sports. One of my friends sat me down and said, get off of it. What's a sport? It's something you play yourself and it's something you watch other people play. So while I don't see the great thrill in watching people play video games, I understand that's filling stadiums. Billions of hits on YouTube where superstars are created. I think eSports is absolutely compelling. One of the things I want to do, we've done a lot of work in sports. We see baseball's fans are getting older and older. 
and I think as they age out, I'm not sure they're going to be replaced by younger people. So the question we ask with eSports, are these 20-year-olds who absolutely love eSports, will they take that love with them the rest of their lives? Or when they turn 40, will they go to baseball, basketball, and give up eSports? I tend to think it's the former. So gaming and sports, gaming overall, has become absolutely extraordinary. The biggest Hollywood opening of all time, forget the, they are inflated dollars, I think was the um, Force Awakens at about $200 million for the opening week. Call of Duty 4 did a billion dollars in their opening week. Fortnite, which is partial, half owned by um, Tencent in China, Fortnite is now becoming its own media company and channel. So what's happening in gaming is really extraordinary. All right, questions behind me. All right, since I see a bunch of them, let's... How do you think broadcast nets with OT2 services will get around password sharing? That's an interesting question. <coughs> Till now, um, Netflix and Amazon and HBO Go haven't cared about password sharing. Their sort of attitude is get everybody hooked on it and then eventually we'll sort it all out. At CES this year, there was a company that's offering a service saying we can track down how many passwords. I think what we're moving to is you will see that enforced and you'll see family plans as well where kids at college don't have to have their own subscription. I think that's a technological problem that can be solved as soon as those companies want to. Does Amazon realistically have the, oh, does Amazon realistically have the bandwidth to support the volume that an NFT primary provider contract would supply? The richest company in the world, they can support pretty much whatever they want. The argument that's been used against Amazon getting the Super Bowl, for example, is 25 years ago there was talk that the Super Bowl might go to cable or pay cable, and all of a sudden large chunks of the audience couldn't watch it. Same with the Olympics. And that would cause a revolt in Congress. That may have been true. But if Amazon got the Super Bowl, keep in mind Amazon, according to our work, already reaches 65% of households. If they started getting NFL sports, that would probably knock that figure up another 10 or 15%. So they already basically have almost the reach of a full broadcast network. So I don't think that's an argument. Amazon can pretty much do whatever they want. And the other, the other fascinating thing about Amazon, you all know this, I assume you think about it, is Netflix, I said, should have been $40. They've just raised their price $2. You ask an American, how much does Amazon Prime Video cost? And they look at you with a puzzled expression and say, well, it's sort of free because everybody buys it for the shipping. And so they, I mean, they, they almost can't do anything wrong. How long before Netflix has to sell ads? That's a really interesting question. Uh, they will, Hulu has gotten to 25 million. I haven't verified that. I speak at the Hulu retreat next week and I plan to ask about that. They use the 25, so let's take them at their word. By being a hybrid model, uh, I don't know how much more programming you can create and buy. I know that's infinite or not. You know, one of, I say this as a joke, but sort of what we, you guys were saying at the beginning. Uh, you know, the Americans, we're almost at the point where the American Psychiatric Association is making too much television a disorder. It's that nagging feeling of anxiety when people say, you've got to watch Ozark. You've got to watch Killing Eve. You've got to all, all these shows, you've got, now it's every, you've got to watch The Americans. All these shows, I mentioned that I finally got to my 62 episodes of Breaking Bad. 
So about a, two years ago, I had all these friends saying, you got to watch Billions on Showtime uh, with Damian Lewis and Paul Giamatti, who's never had a bad performance in his life. So I started watching Billions. And it was pretty, I'm not, I'm not a critic, it was pretty good. Then I watched the second one, and I realized, as I was watching the second one, I didn't want to like it. I wanted to not like it. Because if I could not like it, I was freed from signing a contract in blood that I would watch every episode for the next seven years. And unlike the television I grew up with, where you could watch one episode one week and come back a month later, this stuff, you can't do that. If you miss one episode, you have to frantically hope it's streamed or a friend has recorded it. So we really are in this world of so much television. I don't know how much more we can create, but I know that Reed Hastings will do everything in his power not to take advertising. And with that, I think we are out of town time. Thank you very, very much.